especially to be co-sponsoring this event um, with our host uh, and good friend Gary Dimsky and his staff at the UC Center at Sacramento. About a year ago, there was a question whether the subprime crisis and the wave of foreclosures had crested and it was beginning to go away. Some believe that the bad numbers had peaked or soon would peak as the inventories of unsold homes would gradually drop. But by most estimates, the problem has gotten worse and much worse. Last week, we learned that there are over a million homes in foreclosure nationally, the highest rate ever recorded. 2.5% of all home loans are now in foreclosure, and the rate at which homes enter foreclosure has continued to rise. <coughs> California's number is, is almost certainly higher, probably 3.5% or more of all loans. And while subprime loans make up the uh, bulk of the problem, the delinquencies are growing in prime fixed rate loans as well. We're reminded often too that we're not entirely out of the woods in terms of the domino effect that securitized subprime loans may have on the entire system of credit. The impact on borrowers and their families, of course, has been especially severe. It's increasingly clear that new policies at the federal and state level that would reduce the impact on individuals, their communities, and the economy need to be seriously considered. It's also clear that these policies aimed at, at needed relief for those in over their heads, perhaps, must not inadvertently worsen the problem, possibly by making lenders more reluctant to extend credit. We're honored to have with us today several individuals who are in the midst of the fray in trying to mitigate this crisis. Jeff Crump, here in the middle, is an Associate Professor of Housing Studies at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. His current research focuses on subprime lending and foreclosure in the Twin Cities in Greater Minnesota. He's testified on behalf of anti-predatory lending legislation in the state and is the chair of a state legislative study to implement an electronic foreclosure data system <coughs> in the state of Minnesota. Kevin Stein, to Jeff's left, is the Associate Director of the California Reinvestment Coalition. At CRC, Kevin works primarily on housing issues, including efforts to fight predatory mortgage lending. And at the far right is Tia Bogan-Patterson. She serves as a Special Assistant to the Speaker of the California State Assembly, Karen Bass, and provides policy expertise and advice on subjects such as state and federal regulations and programs affecting housing that fall under the Assembly Committees on Housing and Community Development and Jobs and Economic Development. Each of our panelists is going to speak for a few minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session um, with the moderator, Gary Dimsky, and then move on, most importantly, to your questions. So, Jeff? Thank you, and uh, thanks, Gary, for uh, having me out here. As a, as a native Californian, it's, uh, it's neat to come home, uh, but I, I wish that I had probably more cheerful news to give you. Um, I'll talk uh, first a bit about foreclosure in Minnesota and then talk about the legislative uh, bills that we have passed and uh, one that has not passed. And uh, statewide, we've seen an 84% increase between 06 and 07. We're had about 20,000 or so uh, foreclosures. That's estimated in the state of Minnesota. Um, in 2007, bear in mind that Minnesota is uh, considerably smaller than California. Minnesota is about 5 million people. About 3 million of those are in the Twin Cities. Twin Cities Metro uh, saw a similar increase, uh, 12,885. I started this study back in 2003. In, in 2002, um, we had 1,300 foreclosures in the Twin Cities Metro. Uh, and just to give you a little idea uh, of what we're facing. The core, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey County, Minneapolis and St. Paul, had a, about a 79% increase. And interestingly, um, and uh, to our dismay, we've seen the suburban increase actually exceed the uh, inner city or core county increases. And then exurbs, the kind of ca shoulder counties of the seven county metro, um, had a smaller rate of <coughs> increase in foreclosures, but there's many indications that foreclosure is spreading to uh, exurban and even into rural Minnesota. To look a little bit at subprime loans, and 2006 is the most recent year that uh, Home to Date is available. Um, the bottom line here is uh, one of the interesting things is that the shoulder counties are kind of counties really on the edge of the commuting 
zone of the twin cities actually had the highest percentage of subprime loans even exceeding the core counties and so in zero six and these are actually origination over around twenty six percent of our sub prime of our home mortgages were subprime loans and this in zero two this was about fifteen percent so we continue to see an increase and it'll be interesting of course to get the two thousand and seven data sometime uh, early in the fall we hope um, to kind of give you a, a visual of this the the map I guess on your left uh, is the percentage of subprime loan originations by census tract um, and the core cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul are, are, are right in here. Um, the darkest color are census tracts that have 50% and above all their home loan originations subprime. And these are concentrated in the minority uh, neighborhoods of Minneapolis and St. Paul. This pattern has been consistent over the five years that I've been doing this study. And then the map on the right are the 2007 sheriff sales or foreclosures in the seven county Twin Cities metro. Um, and if I had more time, I could show you a series of maps um, back to 02, um, but we've seen a spread in intensity, in particular in predominantly African American North Minneapolis, where subprime loans were uh, the, the biggest, uh, had the biggest impact. The foreclosures are just, well, it's very uh, astonishing to us. Up in here in North Minneapolis, this is St. Paul over <coughs> here. But these are the, the suburban counties. This is Dakota County down in here. This is Anoka County up here. And so you see that in 07, by 07, this, there's a tremendous spread effect going on out there. And I have done some uh, field work down in Dakota County, and there are many hundreds of abandoned townhomes, places that are not secured against the weather, um, and this is something new that we're seeing. This is just a close-up of Minneapolis and St. Paul. This is actually two years' worth of foreclosure data, uh, 06 and 07, and um, there's actually only two counties in Minnesota, Hennepin, where Minneapolis is, and Dakota, that provide electronic uh, or web-based data on foreclosure. The rest of this has been gathered by hand. And this is a very time-consuming and expensive operation. But you can see this, just this cloud of foreclosure in North Minneapolis. Um, <laughs> the city of St. Paul right now is reporting about 2,000 abandoned structures. And one of the things we found, which is not in indicated in the foreclosure data, is that about 60% of the foreclosures in, uh, say, North Minneapolis were investor-owned not owner-occupied, although it's difficult for us to keep track of this. But this is a very different story than owner-occupied foreclosure, and it's having a real ripple effect in the rental market, too. <clears throat> I'll talk a bit about the Minnesota legislation um, that I've helped out with a bit uh, <coughs> over the last couple years. Last year, we passed an anti-predatory lending bill. Um, um, we'd like to think it's one of the best uh, anti-predatory lending pieces of legislation in the country. Um, it requires that borrowers verify, um, that lenders, I'm sorry, verify borrowers' ability to repay. It prohibits loan churning, rapid refinancing, no negative amortization loans, provides for a duty of agency for mortgage brokers, uh, mandates counseling for so-called special mortgages, i.e. Uh, Habitat for Humanity loans. We find found that many people had good Habitat for Humanity loans on their houses, but they were refinanced out of those loans into subprime loans. Uh, a right to private action uh, against uh, lenders and also a legal definition of mortgage fraud. Uh, prosecutors were reluctant to, to go after obvious cases of mortgage fraud because it wasn't defined uh, legally. Fraud is in general. Um, and we've had a lot of flipping and a lot of mortgage fraud uh, throughout the Twin Cities metro. This bill had widespread support and did pass last year. Uh, one of the indications of what's happened is um, prior to the bill taking effect, there were over 4,000 uh, licensed mortgage brokers in the state of Minnesota. Um, the most recent count is about 1,300. So there's been a lot of people who've given up their licenses. <laughs> Um, and, but bear in mind, of course, like all other state laws that are uh, dealing with predatory lending,
lending. It only it does not apply to federally covered <coughs> banks and uh, and large lenders such as Countrywide, for example. And I had to laugh. Uh, Countrywide actually owns my home loan, <laughs> and uh, and they sent me a letter saying that they'd be happy to refinance me, and they offered me a no document loan. Uh, a, a option arm. They had a long list of things they were offering me that are actually illegal, according to Minnesota's anti-predatory <laughs> lending legislation. Okay, uh, beginning in last fall, uh, there were five working groups that were convened um, by Representative Joe Mullery of uh, Minneapolis. These were bipartisan groups that brought together people from lots of different um, points of view. Um, and we have passed uh, 11 bills in the 2008 legislature in Minnesota dealing with foreclosure. Um, the one I worked on, I was the chair of the foreclosure data committee, um, and that bill passed. One of the things it does is add things like the address to the notice of pendency, the certificate of sheriff sale, and so on. Those of us that like to make maps find it frustrating not to have the address. We have to actually go, we have the property description. We have to go through an additional time-consuming step to get those addresses to map the foreclosures, right? So we have this huge problem happening in our community. We can't actually track it very good. The other thing that's just beginning is a study to develop uh, and hopefully implement statewide electronic data collection of foreclosure data. Um, and uh, we hopefully will get this at least for the seven county <coughs> metro starting out. Uh, but there's lots of issues with this. It is public data, um, but some folks are afraid of what happens when it gets to be more readily accessible. In terms of tenants issues, there is a bill that passed on notification. That is notifying, tenants now need to be notified if they're signing a lease on a place that's in foreclosure or if a place they're living in actually goes into foreclosure. So tenants were signing leases, paying first and last month's rent and so on, only to find out the place is in foreclosure and then they get evicted, right? Um, and a recent survey of homeless people in the Twin Cities found that about a quarter of the homeless in Twin Cities uh, were homeless as a result of foreclosure in one form or another. <coughs> uh, we passed another bill dealing with utilities. This allows tenants to pay utility bills to keep the lights and gas on. Heat is a very big issue in Minnesota. Although in the wintertime, the utilities are not actually allowed to turn the heat off in structures. Um, and then uh, mandatory expungement of foreclosure-related related evictions. People are getting, getting evicted and they're ending up with negative things on their rental record and then they weren't able to actually find another place to live. Um, I think probably the most significant piece that did go through was a pre-foreclosure notification requirement. There's a lot of um, uh, interest, and of course, in foreclosure prevention efforts. And so the way this is going to work is that when the lender says, sends a notice of default to a borrower, they have to provide a notice that the person will get foreclosure counseling. And um, the borrower can only opt out. So they put a, they're going to put a form in there that says, hey, you're going to get counseling. If you don't want it, you've got to send something in. The lenders are going to provide the name, address, and telephone to the HUD approved foreclosure counseling agencies in the state of Minnesota. And um, they're ramping up and there has been a considerable amount of funding both from the, from the state and the federal level in foreclosure counseling. And then the counseling agency is uh, going to then contact the homeowner. So this is all pre-foreclosure. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, how well these prevention efforts work. One thing that you have to remember is that foreclosure prevention efforts basically depend on the willingness of lenders to negotiate loans or, you know, and in some cases to, it's difficult to even get the lenders to respond, okay? <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, probably the most interesting one, the Minnesota Subprime Borrower Relief Act of 2008. This would have provided uh, one-year foreclosure deferment for people who have subprime loans or for people who have negatively amortized loans. Uh, the borrower would be required to continue to make reasonable payments to the lender, and then foreclo foreclosure counseling would be provided to try to negotiate between the borrower and the lender. <coughs> uh, 
Um, this actually did pass the Minnesota legislature. It only passed the Senate by uh, one vote, <coughs> not a veto-proof majority by any means, um, and was vetoed by Governor Tim Pawlenty uh, of Minnesota subsequently to that. And that happened like right on the last day uh, of the legislative session. This, was a, this, is, this year, the Minnesota session is a so short session. It's a biennial kind of situation. Uh, it, the debate, I think, is very interesting here, and it, it points out uh, a lot of the, the things we're hearing, uh, those of us who work in this area. That, uh, Governor Pawlenty argued that, that this would effectively renegotiate existing contracts between the borrower and the lender, and he also argued that it would raise the cost of credit. And so, quoting from the uh, governor, it could have a negative impact on the credit market for the 98% of Minnesotans who are not in foreclosure. So this is a cost argument. <clears throat> the advocates of the bill argued that the loans that would be affected are actually now illegal in Minnesota. Right? Negatively amortized loans are illegal in the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that certain borrowers are still not able to offer them because our law is not applying. Um, and that this is essential to prevent further erosion of property <coughs> values. Um, it, the, the effects of foreclosure on property values uh, spread well beyond the neighborhoods that they occur in. And I know that Ramsey County, where St. Paul is, is projecting another 20% uh, drop in housing values by 2009. <coughs> and so I think one of the things about foreclosure that's important to remember is that it doesn't just affect the family who loses their home. It affects the entire neighborhood and the entire communities. And the county people are like, hey, uh, what's happening to our property tax base? It's declining significantly. And I'll, I'll end here. Prentice Cox, uh, who uh, was an attorney with the Minnesota uh, Attorney General's <laughs> Office and now teaches at the University of Minnesota, who authored the bill, his response, I think, was interesting. The notion that lenders will refuse to make financially, financially sensible loans based on Minnesota helping subprime borrowers now can accurately be described as a threat of class warfare. It may make good if divisive politics inciting fear in the affluent against homeowners in need, but it doesn't make sense from a market perspective. And I think what he's saying is that, you know, uh, the mortgage deferment lenders would continue to make profitable home loans, although in the current state of the mortgage market, it's unknown what the flow of capital into housing is going to be. I think I've used up my, my 12 minutes, and I thank you. Having me, it's great to be here. Um, I do hope that um, you will find some value in, in this presentation and the others, and I do hope that we'll um, ultimately be able to kind of move things forward in a positive way uh, from a policy perspective in California. Um, so that's my that's my goal. Uh, as a fallback, when I came in, I was mistaken for a PhD, so I'm somewhat satisfied uh, to an extent, regardless of what happens. Um, I guess like Jeff in, uh, in introducing things, um, this, the, our perspective often, or at least mine, <coughs> tends to be somewhat negative. Um, and I guess that will come through, but if in case it doesn't, we think the situation right now is, um, is untenable. It cannot continue. It is terrible for, for all the reasons that Jeff has mentioned. Um, we are hopeful that we can kind of move some policy solutions that will really help communities and help borrowers. At times, we are really challenged in maintaining <coughs> that hope. Um, so maybe maybe this conversation will be good for me. Maybe I'll feel better coming out of it. <coughs> One of the things that I took from Jeff's comments, a couple, and um, a couple of times it kind of raised this uh, issue of what will happen, what are the arguments against regulation because really we're needing, things are not happening voluntarily. I think people, I hope people accept that. And we may need to kind of require some institutions to do things that they're not now doing for whatever reason. And one of the arguments that's raised every single year, I, don't, I wonder how far back this goes, um, is that it will, if you, too, if you regulate too much, we're gonna dry up access to credit. 
that you'll tinker too much, and despite your, you know, this is what they say, you know, we know you guys are well-meaning, uh, and you, you're trying to help people, but you're really going to hurt people because you'll regulate in the market, as I guess one of the governor's arguments in Minnesota, is you, you, will, you, you will scare away the investors. Well, guess what? For the last at least eight years that I've been watching this, that ar argument has held sway. And, and I would submit that, that not nearly enough has been done on the state or federal level, level to reform lending practices um, because in part people were saying, yeah, we don't want to go too far. Well, the result of that failure to sufficiently regulate has led to the crisis we are now in, which has also led to the tightening of credit that we were warned would be our responsibility from regulation. So I just, I just want to, hopefully that makes some sense. It was a long sentence. <laughs> but, um, but basically, I look, at the, I look at the lender's performance and I say, right now we have dried up access to credit for people who need it because you guys went too far. And why would investors want to come back if they didn't think there was a reasonable expectation that the borrower is going to be able to repay their loans. I mean, that is so basic. The debate we're having right now is should we require that the lenders ensure there's an ability to repay on the part of the borrowers? That's a very sad situation for us all to be in. That's, a, that's a, not a, the best, I think, debate we, we could be having right now. All right, haven't said, so I haven't even gotten to anything else. I'll try and quickly, in a way as Jeff did, um, move through how we, we see the issue, how we kind of frame the issue, and then get to some of the policy solutions. We look at the Humda data and we looked over the years at the greater likelihood that people of color have in getting higher cost subprime loans. And this is meant to show for, for borrowers of different races and ethnicities in California as a whole, um, African Americans, Latinos, more than two times as likely as white borrowers to be getting these high cost loans. And this is significant because much of the problem, not all of it we're talking about right now, really is, the, is in the subprime market. Um, this is looking at neighborhoods. So in neighborhoods throughout California where more than 80% of the residents were people of color, um, those neighborhoods were more than three times as likely to be getting these higher cost loans than neighborhoods that were, were pretty much white neighborhoods. So there's, we think there's kind of a, uh, a spatial component to all this. So we definitely have this fair lending, fair housing um, lens through which we look at everything. Obviously, foreclosures in California, not a big issue a couple of years ago. Um, we think we're, we're clearly, if not the most impacted state, one of the most impacted states of all. And whenever you look at these, who are, what cities in the country are most uh, afflicted by foreclosures, we're seven out of 10. And it's, off, it's mostly in the Valley, as people know, and San Diego. And, it's terrible and it's, and it's getting worse. This is, um, this is a list of the top 20 subprime lenders in 2006, again, the most recent year for which we have data. It's not significant, I think, to be interesting to look at who these folks are, um, but the, the one, what I wanted to pull out is the, the ones that are listed in bold face are lenders that, in essence, don't exist anymore, that they've either been shut down by their parent companies or they went into bankruptcy, or they decided that they can't lend anymore. And I guess how we would view that is th those are the, the poster child for the bad lending that has occurred over the last couple of years that has put us in this situation. And when I, so we can, we say that, um, and, and, and you know, people are nodding their heads. Uh, but even the General Accountability Office put out a report a few months ago, and they said, why are we in this crisis? Housing prices went down makes it harder for people to refinance or sell their properties if they're in trouble. Um, they said lax underwriting, right, which we, which I think this is lax underwriting, which we would call bad lending. And that's the GAO, and people know that the GAO, GAO is not really, it's not on the vanguard of, um, you know, they're, they're, they're researchers. So, so I think everyone recognizes the lending has been bad. And these, are, these guys, made so many loans that went into default that they basically had to go out of business. Okay, well, what's the significance of that? We did a report with some of our allies in other states where we looked at not just that second slide I showed you, where are the subprime loans going by neighborhood, but where are the loans made, the subprime loans made by these lenders that went out of business for making too many bad loans? And so for California, I looked at LA County. This is a, in the aggregate for all the groups. 
And, and, uh, and basically, there's a disproportionate amount of mislending by, we call them high-risk lenders, in neighborhoods of color, in LA County, in New York City, in Charlotte, in Boston, in, in the areas that we looked at. So the lenders are gone, but their loans are still in our neighborhoods. In a sense, you know, like picking time bombs, we think, waiting to go bad because their rates are resetting or people are just scraping by and people have family emergencies and situations. So it's not like by any means we're, we're um, uh, in, a, in safe territory. This is, these are a couple of maps that, that don't show, I think, very well, certainly not as nice as the professor. Maybe I should have skipped these. I didn't know I was going to be after him. <laughs> but we did this. There are a couple of people from, from the Sacramento Redevelopment Agency here, um, and we work with them to try and look at what's happening in Sacramento. Uh, and so the first, what this was meant to show is um, this is where the subprime loans were in Sacramento, with the darker areas being uh, more uh, neighborhoods that are uh, more uh, diverse uh, in terms of the residents. And then the next slide is where the foreclosure filings are happening. And the maps look a little different, but basically you can see that the dots are kind of very similar. And I think that's what the professor was showing earlier. Um, we have some friends in, in New York that did a map that did a side by side on the same page, and it looks like the exact same map. Where were the subprime loans? Where are the foreclosures? Uh, this is something put together by Credit Suisse that is meant to show that the problems are not going away. This is where rates are resetting on adjustable rate loans. And so the second bar is the end of 2008. So we're not quite there. If things go down, people are wor really worried about these 228 loans and the 327 loans that we're all adjusting kind of about now. Um, but we see several months going out, it starts peaking again. And this chart actually breaks down those peaks by the kinds of loans that are kind of, that are resetting, that are potentially problematic. And it may be hard to see, but this greenish bar um, right here, these are the option arm loans. So there are a lot of option arm loans where people may understand that the borrowers are paying less than the principal, less than the interest. They're owing more on their loan with each payment they make. And yet, those, those are gonna, you have to pay the piper at some point, and the piper is going to be paid a few months out. So we need to kind of, and nobody's really thinking, how do we deal with the option arms? Um, the sh our focus <coughs> with the increasing foreclosures has shifted from focusing on the lending and saying that we need to better regulate the rent, the lending practices, the industry needs to be a little bit more responsible or a lot more responsible with lending, to looking at the servicing of loans. How do borrowers stay in their loans? What happens, what's the difference between someone who's in trouble and can stay in their loan and someone who's in trouble and is foreclosed upon? And the, every day, the, the, the critical conversation is between the borrower who's behind on their payments or worried about being so, and the person who answers the phone from the servicing company. And it all happens right there. There are policies, and we talk to people at the institutions. It's kind of what we normally do is deal with the banking institutions, the larger ones, and we talk to them about their policies. But really what happens depends on maybe even the mood of the person answering the phone on behalf of the servicing company. And from our perspective, there are, there are basically no rules in place that protect the interests of the consumer as relating to these conversations. Anything that the servicing company does and feels obligated to do is a result of contracts they have with the investors or with the trustees on these big loan pools that have been securitized that were mentioned in the opening. Nothing that says you have to even deal with the borrower, um, generally speaking, from our perspective. I think basically it's the servicer's obligation with respect to borrowers is if they make a payment, you can't keep the payment. So that's, I mean, so that's kind of, I think, what we, we need to do a little bit better. And so what we have been pushing for, one of the things we've been pushing for is to try and get these, have these conversations result in better outcomes for borrowers. And that means for communities, as Jeff was saying, because the borrowers go under, devastation for the borrower. You have tenants in there, devastation for the tenant. And they get no notice. They don't know what's going on. And they're completely innocent if anybody's guilty. Um, the neighborhood goes down, blight, on the, blight in the community, property tax revenue for the city, economy of the state. It doesn't make sense. We should be trying to figure this stuff out. But there's not been real, a real concerted effort. Um, so we've been pushing loan modifications. Um, 
we met with the larger institutions and they said, we are with you, we don't want the homes, it costs us $60,000, Andrew and Mozilla told us it costs us $60,000, we want to work stuff out, we're interested in loan modifications, they all kind of said the same thing. And then the next, you know, the, within the next couple of weeks we would get calls and emails from our counseling agency members and consumers who would tell us that what they experienced was directly in conflict with what we have been told. People calling, and we still get this, people calling and saying, being responsible, okay, they're in trouble, being responsible, calling this loan servicer and saying, I am worried my loan is going to reset. I'm going to have to pay more in a few months. I don't think I can do it. Can we work something out now? And people are being told probably every single day, call us back when you're in default. And that's directly in conflict with what the CEOs of the companies are saying to us. Well, that's not maybe a huge surprise, but what they're saying publicly. They're saying this is their, what they're telling the governor, what they're telling our governor, what they're telling the, the Treasury Secretary of the United States. So something is, is amiss. We did a survey of the counseling agencies because we found this huge disconnect between what the companies were saying that they were doing and what the people on the ground were saying was happening to borrowers. And just kind of quickly some of the key findings of these two surveys. So what were the surveys? We talked to about 38 counseling agencies in this state. And we asked them about their experiences for a particular month. And in the months we asked about, they had seen, we had done two of them, either 8,000 consumers or 10,000 consumers in another one. So we don't think that's an insignificant uh, lay of the land. Give us a picture of what's really happening. 10,000 people. Are loan modifications happening where the, land, the servicer is willing to restructure the loans so that it becomes more affordable? No. For the most part, no. What are the most common outcomes, we asked the counseling agencies, the most common outcome for our, ba our borrowers, the people who have the wherewithal, maybe not to be able to make their payments, but to come in and seek help with us, someone who's qualified to, who understands this stuff, who may have a relationship with the servicing company. The most common outcome we get for those people is foreclosure. And that's just... I mean, what can you say about that? The second was short sale, where people are basically agreeing to move. Um, are, is there outreach being done beforehand? No. Uh, and, this, and we have the governor's agreement, which I'll mention in a second. Um, strong and numerous complaints about the servicers being hard to work with, stuff you cannot imagine. I mean, it's chaos. <coughs> Faxes are lost. Phone calls are not returned. Um, you have the, the turnover at the servicing companies, and that's got to be a terrible job to be working for a servicer. Two minutes. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Except that it's a terrible situation there. We're starting to do a third survey, and some of the things that are that are coming out that we'll release in a couple couple weeks. Foreclosures still seem to be number one. People, we ask more about the underlying loans. What are the loans? What do the loans look like that people are coming in with? They can't make their payments, and the, and the, the counseling agencies are saying we the loans never should have been made. They were unaffordable loans. We see issues around fraud, fraudulent loans. Um, we see a lot of Spanish-speaking consumers who have English-only documents. It's a big issue. And, and basically, we need to have the companies write down the loans to make them more affordable. We have put forth a few principles around what we thought should happen, and I probably mentioned most of them. Just the last couple of things. There, so there's a package of bills that the consumer groups have supported in Sacramento. Um, and consumer groups, it's ACORN, Consumers Union, the California Labor Federation, us, California Reinvestment Coalition, CalPERG, and um, Center for Responsible Lending. I think I have everybody. And we are not excited about how things are going. The first one, 1137, is Don Prada's bill, and it has probably the best chance to succeed. It does three things. It would deal somewhat with the tenant issue, saying that people should have notice, tenants should have notice, and they should be given some time before they have to leave. Um, it puts some obligations on the banks that take over foreclosed properties in terms of maintaining the properties. That's another big issue. And it requires that the that there be an effort to have a discussion, this conversation, this increasingly important conversation between borrower and servicer, um, that, they, that they have to have the conversation and discuss alternatives to foreclosure. The big issue, we're, the big bill we're talking about right now is 1830, which is the anti-predatory lending bill. The bill that, in essence, we've been talking about for years. We need to regulate lending practices. Now things are so bad, there might be an opportunity. There is an opportunity to talk about it. We're not sure how that's going to go. And I'll just move on. 
in terms of other opportunities the governor has an agreement with the city with a number of servicing companies to his credit when he when he announced i think in the october november we 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 applauded it we said that was great um which is you know which was not something that we normally do but it looked like a really a positive thing i think it is a positive thing we're not sure if it's really working he was going to work with servicers to and they would agree to work with borrowers in a in a certain somewhat limited way but a very positive way and we want to see if there's room to work with the governor's office and the and the good our good commissioner for the department of corporations trustee luke richard who's i think really trying to figure this stuff out for the benefit of everyone um can we move that forward so that we know that the agreement as it exists is working and being honored because right now we don't there's a lack of transparency that's one of our concerns and also can we build <coughs> off of it and what and maybe this will be one of the last things i say is that um because i know we're out of time but um, one of the things that we want to do in a constructive way is to try and is to maybe work with the administration, which has a relationship with the servicers, to use its good office to facilitate a conversation or a few conversations between the servicing companies and the counseling agencies who know all of the roadblocks to successful outcomes. A lot of this is very, can, we, we think a lot of it is there problems with the process and in large part that's because no one even though we were predicting things were going to get bad i think no one knew how bad they were going to get and even the servicers are, are overwhelmed and so we're hoping that we can kind of move forward in a constructive way to say let's streamline our processes processes and coordinate them for the benefit of the borrowers and communities we talked about the tenant issues um, funding for counselors another big issue is is can we work together with the state to make sure you know our number one priority is to keep borrowers in their homes but foreclosure is a reality these days can we do something to reclaim the properties so that they can be a resource for communities and be used as affordable housing home ownership or rental opportunities put first-time home buyers in there etc um, and we in our normal way of doing things we are trying to raise all of these issues with the larger financial institutions in their role as servicer, in their role as trustees. So we're talking with, like we had a conversation with US Bank. What can US Bank as a large trustee that's responsible for representing the interests of investors on these big pools of loans, what can they do to, su to support tenants who are affected, communities that look at blight, to push servicers to, uh, to the extent feasible to try and modify loans, and I think we're in the early stages of those conversations, but also raising with the financial institutions, when you take over the property, uh, what do you do? What do you do for the tenants? Um, so we're trying to work on all fronts, and I think maybe with that, in the interest of time, I will close. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we'll have more time in, in discussion to hit some of those remaining points Let's turn now to Tia Bookman Patterson. Tia. industry has changed you know 20 years ago everybody kept their loans and that's who you called but times change but also during that time period you have to realize that the, the lending that was going on uh, had a lack of credit in low-income communities and so subprime in and of itself was not a bad thing it's just like prescription drugs if you abuse them or if something happens and it's broken down then it becomes very problematic. And so what I think has happened is there was a perfect storm. And what happened is with the securitization and Wall Street and everyone who came on board, people got very, very greedy. And in that greed, um, you, you had securitization that was going on and new, new <laughs> loan products that came about. And so at some point, people overreached. And that's when everything came to a, a crashing, uh, burning, where we are today. 
And so some of the things that have spurred the crisis, Kevin went into them, but um, you have you know, the deterioration of the underwriting guidelines. There were no underwriting guidelines. You could fog a mirror, basically, and you could get a loan. And so, so you, they were handing out money. So this, a lot of these loans were people that never should have gotten these loans to begin with. You had um, variable interest rates resets, which Kevin talked about. You had the 228s and the 327s, where they qualified getting in on the interest only. And then when they got ready to reset, then it was problematic because they didn't have the, 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 the income to support that new reset on the loan. You had softening of employment and the local economy. And then you had these homes that had somewhat been artificially inflated the appreciation. And so you had all that perfect storm of things that came about. And so when Kevin and the professor talked about lender reform, that's almost going forward. And so what are, well, let me get to the results. So we can skip all this because you, Kevin's already gone through what's happened and where we are. But all what we've talked about is what to do post but what do we do now, and how do we help people now? And that has been one of the most difficult things to deal with because you get pushback on things like we don't want to do a tax taxpayer bailout. We don't; these people got themselves in this bad position. But you know, you have entire neighborhoods that are destabilizing. And so, some of the legislation that I want to talk about talks about things that maybe we can do now that Kevin didn't cover in some of his lender reform issues. But twenty-five. is a Mullen Nunez bill, and I see Mr. Mullen staff, Steve, and my, um, but we worked very closely with the California Redevelopment Association and some of our local redevelopment agencies to allow for tax increment money that goes to a local redevelopment agency to be spent more flexibly. Currently, you cannot spend your 80% money outside of a redevelopment project area. Well, many of these homes are happening in the suburbs or outside of that project area, but the fact that they're vacant and boarded up and empty have a direct impact on that project area. So if you were able to take those 80% monies that are reserved for economic development purposes and spend it outside of the project area to help in home ownership and, and, and decrease in blighting conditions, that's what this bill would allow you to do. Also, it would allow you to use your 20% money, which is reserved for low and moderate income housing. You would have to follow all of the existing laws and that you would, could not spend that money in, in proportion to your, uh, disproportionately to your unmet needs. So if in your community the requirement was that you have a regional housing needs and there would have been an assessment done that said you had to do very low or low income, you could not now take that money and spend it all on home ownership. So there's some limitations in this legislation. And so from a public-private and public-public partnership, this was the, one of the most reasonable things that we could think to come up with to allow our local communities to use monies that they have currently to help with this crisis and just be able to allow them to use it more flexibly. And um, I, I would really like to have some conversation with maybe some of the consumer groups as, as well because I know there is some opposition from some of the affordable housing advocates because they believe that this fu these funds should be reserved for very low and low. But the law does say very low, low and moderate. So I would like to continue to have those conversations with those uh, those advocates as well. Now, the, here are a couple of bills that deal with either uh, reporting the data and the collection on the front end so that we can continue to see what's going on so we can have those conversations with the governor's office about these agreements so that we can, where are we? Are we really having these workouts? Well, in order to know, you be, have to have the, um, the data and the reporting. So AB 69 Lou deals with the uh, reporting of the data and the collection. AB 180 uh, by Assemblywoman Bass deals with foreclosure consultant reform because what we are seeing are several scams going on and our poor people are getting scammed upon because there's no regulation or oversight on these foreclosure consultants. AB 529 deals with notification of rate reset. So prior to your rate getting reset, if you're, if you're in a 228 that there would have to be at least a minimum of a three-month notice. 
And Kevin, one of the things he talked about he would like to see as well is some information going out. And so it might be a good idea to work with that author on additional information that could go out with that notice of reset, whether it's home foreclosure counseling, et cetera. But that's a piece of legislation worth looking at. AB 2161, which deals with mortgage lender complaints, is, uh, and all of these bills are still active and, and, and uh, have moved to the Senate side. But this, uh, one of the things Kevin was mentioning was that there is no process, when you call this lender or the servicer, what grievance procedure or happens or how do you ensure that something is going on because frankly they're lying. They're telling people that they're working it out and they're representing these things but we have too many people calling the legislature or Kevin's office and the professor says he gets the same thing. It's just not happening. So some kind of a procedural grievance procedure that the actual borrower can um, go through if he's not getting an adequate response. AB 2509, Gal Gianni. This is an interesting bill and it has problems because we have no idea how we're gonna fund it. But what it does is it creates a mortgage loan guarantee program. And the, the basis behind that was, is if the state were to put into an account, a trust fund, amount of money that could act as a partial guarantee, would lenders be incentivized to come in and refinance that loan? And so we've been in discussions and actually some of the federal legislation that has recently been introduced and passed has um, talked about ensuring using the insurance program yeah. as, as a way of getting some of these refinancing done. Whether it works or not, I don't know. We, we've been trying to engage with lenders and others to see whether or not <coughs> a model like this would work, but I'd like to be able to engage with some of you and get your thoughts back on that. Um, and AJR 45 is just a, um, a resolution urging Congress to pass some of their federal legislation, the biggest piece of which is probably um, HR 3221, the American Housing Rescue and Foreclosure Prevention Act. Um, that's been mocked up, my understanding. They're hoping to take some kind of action on that large piece of legislation sometime in uh, late July. Um, I want to give a special thanks and acknowledgement to the Assembly Banking and Finance Committee and Mark Baruch, who probably should have been up here talking about some of these laws, um, because my issue more is housing as opposed to lending. But I think, I think on 1830, um, I think the consumer groups and the author have worked very, very, very hard on that bill. Um, there are some political realities that we have to deal with. There is industry that you're going to have to deal with. And so to make reasonable accommodations and come to a point to where we're actually going to do something that's pro-consumer and help us going forward, I'm really looking forward to the consumer groups and the author continuing to work together so that they can come up with a good compromise and get a good piece of legislation. So thank you. Thank you. open the floor. I'm going to turn on this microphone and maybe what we can, is this on right now? Good. Uh, maybe what we can do is kind of pass the mic in a communal fashion as we take questions and comments from the audience. Uh, so, the floor, please. What is likely to happen with federal reforms or pending legislation at the federal level? Well, I'll say the little I can say, and I know there are people in the room who <coughs> no better. And hopefully one of them sit next to me or two, or two away. But, um, I mean, we're hopeful that the legislation will pass. Um, I think the president has expressed some concerns about it, so that may complicate things. But from, uh, in terms of, one thing I wouldn't want to see is a, uh, a sense that we should wait for the federal government to act before acting at the state level, because the bills that we're focused on, that we are focused on the consumer groups right now, I think by and large are not going to be addressed at all at the federal level. Um, seems like Congress, to my understanding, is focused on FHA uh, being a, a resource, which I think is really important, and on this uh, support for the for the acquiring of properties, REO properties, which we think is really important. But those are not the issues that we're talking about. We're talking about how do you help people now? How do you um, make sure the bad lending practices don't con don't don't continue going forward? And I don't think they're that's a front burner issue for them. And then the one thing I just want to say on uh, AB 69, uh, which was the servicer data reporting bill that, that Pia mentioned, that was part of our the package of bills that we're interested in. Um, the one piece that we think is most critical and I guess is most controversial and which came out is a provision that would require that the data be made publicly available by loan servicers. So basically you could see what particular companies are doing. And 
right now that the commissioner for the partner corporations is collecting some fairly detailed data from the loan servicers and we we really commend him for that i don't know if other states are doing it and he's releasing it to the public in the aggregate so all the data is lumped together but we don't know what home ec is doing versus what litton is doing and i think if we look at the the home mortgage disclosure act which allows us to look at the lender data um it shows that when you have company specific data number one it doesn't mean any company goes out of business because they wilted under the pressure of their you know the reporting requirements or or how they look but it probably does result in better practices because companies i think will try harder for their data to look good and if it doesn't they'll explain it and then we'll have some public discourse about it but that's not where ab69 is now and we're a little disappointed about that you know Uh, regarding the federal legislation, I think the, the, the biggest or the major obstacle in the negotiations is the, a, a housing trust fund. There was an affordable housing trust fund piece and how that would be um, financed and how that would go to repa repay some of the, uh, that was put in as an amendment. And so I think that may be one of the major obstacles, but I'm, I'm optimist, optimistic, I guess, and I, I would hope that the feds would actually step in because one of, one of the issues that is that I would that there's no data on and I'd like to find out is how many of these loans in California were state regulated in which the state could have, what percentage the state actually could have done something about and then what percentage of these loans were federally regulated and really are the federal responsibility because it's my understanding that probably about 25% of all the subprime and non-traditional loans nationwide probably were made here in California and that may be a little high but that is a lot that is disproportionately a lot of these types of loans that were made in California. So how, what percentage of that was state and what percentage of that was feds? Because frankly, we're continuing to be a donor state and if the feds, if, if, it's so, if a large percentage of these loans were made to the state of California under federal regulation, then that means the, 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 the feds owe us. And so I would hope that they would be able to pass a significant piece of legislation that are gonna help current borrowers who are in their homes, stay in their homes, help us refinance and not and, and continue to not deteriorate and have blighted communities. Um, so nationally, what percentage of homes are currently in foreclosure? How serious of how like how serious? Uh, what percentage? Do you have a good percentage? Well, I think it's very serious. Um, last week. The New York Times uh, had an article that one in 11 mortgages are either in foreclosure or currently in arrears, where people are behind on their on their payments. That's a shocking uh, number. Uh, my understanding is that currently we're looking at probably two million foreclosures this year in in the U.S. as a whole, um, and so that's a considerable number. It, maybe 3% or so are in foreclosure right now. Um, I don't think that's up to the level of the Great Depression, but it's certainly second best, and certainly in the post-World War II era, we're in the most serious situation that, uh, that we've been in, I think. Um, and I think that the geographic spread to suburban and rural locations, I think, is really kind of a scary prospect, I think, right now. So then, um, show that you throw this term uh, refinancing. Is that paying off the loan? What, what is that doing to the loan exactly? Um, and could the national government be re involved in refinancing these loans and stopping this problem now? I'll just say uh, something and I'll pass it on. But in the Great Depression, the Homeowners Loan Corporation was created to, uh, and they refinanced people to keep them in their homes, about 10%, I think, of all the loans. And I have been uh, saying for the last couple years that we need that, we need a response from the federal government at that yeah. level. And I'm just, uh, I continue to be amazed that we're having this debate that seems to be stuck in neutral. Meanwhile, neighborhoods are, are deteriorating at a rapid rate. And the economic spread effects are really evident. So I'll, I'll pass that. I, I don't think it can be a refinance in the traditional sense of refinance. I think everybody's going to have to have a little skin in the game. 
so if you're talking about it's going to have to i'm not going to refinance and pay four hundred fifty thousand dollars for a three hundred thousand dollars house so it has to include some kind of a modification so the lenders or the investors are going to have to take their hit i would imagine that the buyer would have had to have either a down payment made or some skin in the game as well and then the feds because so it's going to have to be some kind of a partnership in this refinance agreement which a B 2509 tried to set up that kind of a partnership so that if it were a guarantee or a refinance that came into place that it would have to require a three-way partnership that there would have to be a some the borrower had put either some form of down payment in the loan has to be modified to the at least the existing uh, current market value, and then the feds are, or the state would be able then to step in and do a guarantee of a portion of that loan, so that it was th it was modeled on there being some type of a partnership. I just want to say that don't forget that the Federal Reserve also used taxpayer money to the tune of three hundred billion dollars to uh, purchase bad subprime paper and also bad auto loans too. For, for so investors. that's yeah, for investors have been bailed out already. Now, now, I'm not arguing that didn't maybe need to be done in, in some respects, but I think we need to keep the debate within that context, too. Yeah, I guess just to follow up on those points on the last, um, and then there's the Bear Stearns, which we talked a little bit about. And are, is that a bailout? But if there was a scorecard of who's being bailed out, it would probably be a few billion dollars on one side, maybe a few hundred billion dollars, and, and maybe zero at this point on the consumer side. Maybe people disagree with that. But uh, in, t in response to your question, I think we, you know, we were very interested in the depression era model that Jeff described. And my understanding is that the concept that Tia was talking about, that's, that's how people are thinking about the FHA right now as being in a position to, to, be, to provide insurance on more loans for people who are in trouble um, where there's kind of a, uh, an, a, an agreement to accept less, to kind of write down the loan. And so that could help a lot of people. It would be voluntary. Uh, so it's unclear how many people w it would help, but I bet it would help a lot of folks. And then one other concept that would help probably, the estimates are you know, hundreds of thousands, is bankruptcy reform to allow the bankruptcy code to be consistent in allowing mortgage debt to be restructured as other debts can be restructured and modified. And that would have probably helped a lot of people, and that was, the, I think it's fair to say that the industry was very, they disagreed strongly with that. Just to say that a barrier uh, to the FHA solution is the quasi-privatization of the FHA. They've been bleeding money, too, and are quasi-accountable on the markets. And so to do a real serious federal intervention at this point, we have to rethink the philosophy of our housing finance support system. And that's going to take some serious political will. And in there. I'll try, and be, I'll try and be quick. So the, the slide was really just meant to show lenders, the largest subprime lenders, the, the lenders that made the most subprime loans. So Countrywide was actually up there twice because they made a lot of loans through Countrywide Home Loans, the mortgage company, and also through Countrywide Bank, the depository institution, which is surprisingly large, like $100 billion in assets. Um, they were not, I, I didn't mean for them to be bolded because they continued, you know, so you could argue, that were they distressed, but they were, they're still making loans. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, that was, if that, that was my mistake if it showed up as bold. Um, it wasn't, okay, so, okay, so they, so that was just meant to show that they were, they are one of the larger subprime lenders. They're the, so Bank of America is buying them. Our organization and a lot of our members and allies opposed their application to buy Countrywide for a number of reasons particular concerns about what would happen to all the borrowers and were there grievance procedures or any real systemic plans in place to help borrowers, which we didn't believe was the case. The Federal Reserve held hearings. We were able to get hearings on the merger. And they recently approved the transaction. So I think that is scheduled to, I, they didn't listen to us, I don't know. It is scheduled to, uh, to go forward, shockingly. 
despite our opposition but as for bank of america they have not made they're not a big sub prime lender except that they used to you know this is a point they at the hearing they said we don't do sub prime loans well they used to own sub prime lenders equity credit and nation's credit probably not remembered fondly as good sub prime lenders and until a couple years ago they owned a company called own it mortgage solutions which was one of the larger sub prime lenders in california they had a controlling interest in it and they also were involved in the securitization of sub prime loans so bank of america is in a sense financing as an issuer of mortgage backed securities um and and playing other roles uh is financing sub prime loans made by other companies and so we say that's not there's not a significant distinction for us if you're does is that is that being a good actor if you're just allowing other companies to use their own underwriting standards and you're making you're basically funding them to make more loans by selling their loans on this on this to investors i believe so let's move farther in the back then we'll come across the aisle yeah um well i'll ask you uh a lot of what pertains to exacerbate the foreclosure problem is the decline in property values now i don't know that any legislation could really stop that but for borrowers who are able to withstand the subprime resetting and so forth what is their incentive to stay in that home when they can go down the block and get perhaps the same model of home that they have now for a hundred or two hundred thousand less and how are you are you guys tracking anything like that how many people are just walking away to buy other low property values and how is that affecting the the price well i i haven't thought of that dynamic where people were buying other properties um you you do hear a lot about this idea of walking away people walking away and uh it's hard to know how real that is like borrowers who are in trouble who are walking away from the services they're not having that conversation they're not giving that conversation a go and we think it's probably overstated how much it, it occurs but it's probably happening and it's probably happening because borrowers are not given reason to hope that they're actually going to be able to stay in their homes that's our view that they're kind of beat, beat this is how it was described to me by a number of counseling agencies that the borrowers they first get the people who might be in the collections department so they're trying to work something out and the person on the phone their job is to really get them to pay money which they may not have not to necessarily work something out so by the time they get to the person that might be more open to trying to work something out on behalf of the company they feel like there's nothing for them and they and people see all the folks going into foreclosures i mean i think everybody knows somebody who's gone into foreclosure at this point which is maybe some hope that we'll get some some reform Yeah, we don't know how many people are just walking away. I mean, there's rumors of what they call jingle mail, you know, where where borrowers are just mailing their keys back to the lenders. Um but I do think it all comes back to that as long as there's a flood of foreclosed homes onto the housing market, that values will continue to go down. And if securities, the securities behind these loans are being written down to 20 cents on the dollar. uh for example then uh you know you're writing the securities down to 20 cents on a dollar but then you're demanding that the borrowers pay back 100% right so there's a massive devaluation going on out there um and you know there's people in neighborhoods that I work in that are very distressed still actually paying their home loans and they're they're really suffering every foreclosed home that happens in that neighborhood the values continue to go down um stuff i don't it, so i now i'm not sure about the mechanics of it but as long as foreclosure is continuing at the pace it is we're not going to be able to restabilize the housing market i don't think i think the focus has to be on stabilizing the market and keeping those credit worthy borrowers who can stay in their home and have the ability to pay in their home in their home And I don't think enough focus has been given on that and and I don't think the feds and and we just don't have any money because we have the money we probably got good information but we they got this little budget deficit problem going on right now. So there has to be some way in which we can stabilize the market and the only way I can see to do that is to provide some kind of insurance or some kind of uh refinancing program to help stabilize the market. But I don't think what you'll see is people leaving one house to buy another house because you're not going to be able to get a loan to buy the next house. So I I don't I don't really see that happening but I do see people walking away but not walking away necessarily to go buy something else. They'll walk away and go be a renter somewhere. Yeah. Which is what'll end up happening. Yeah. 
Yeah, the money that you would have needed for that loan is what uh, the economist William Grant would have called uh, money of the mind, uh, which has now disappeared. Exactly. Uh, let's go first here, and then. Several, well, I don't know if it's several, but there are states that have passed a uh, bill in the last few years that require pre-loan uh, counseling. Looking forward, specifically at the federal legislation, since that still is a majority of all the loans are federally covered loans, uh, what role is that going to play in preventing something like this from happening again? I, I'm not I'm not an expert on what's happening in other states. My understanding is there's been a retreat from an emphasis on counseling. And what I, maybe people will correct me, that Fannie Mae used to require it in certain circumstances for mm -hmm. certain borrowers, and they no longer do. Does anybody know? Okay. So at, um, we think that's that would be, that would help immensely if, there, if you could tie let loans to the provision of counseling, at least in certain circumstances, and I'm told that's one of the things that is politically uh, difficult to imagine happening on a state level. We could do it on the state level, as some states have done, but uh, it doesn't seem like there's an interest in doing that. I, I think there's a lot that could be done to uh, provide borrowers with more accessible information and clear, clear, uh, so they have a clear understanding of loan terms. But I, you know, it, it, my experience is, is that the same people that when you go buy a car and the last person you see is the documents person, you know, and that's like where they charge you for pinstripes and all that stuff that, you know, they're the same people that are selling these loans. And so educate, you know, they're good at their jobs. And so education without regulating the industry, I don't think is actually um, going to be the solution. I mean, policy-wide, in a big sense, we, we promoted home ownership as the housing policy in the U.S., mm -hmm. yet we coupled that with deregulation of the mortgage industry. Mm -hmm. And that combination has uh, proven to be disastrous, yeah. Let's, uh, I, I want to just uh, mention, that we'll, we'll take some more questions, but about uh, 25 after the hour, I'd like to ask our panelists to just reflect on kind of what, you know, we've got a room full of analysts and, and staff members and uh, people involved in this situation. You know, what do you foresee? What would be helpful? What could be done at this point? Uh, so, what, your question first. Um, I work at the local level, and I don't work at the state, but the um, legislature was criticized recently, and the fee is really not moving as quickly or paying enough attention. And I think we heard Kevin's comments on, on some of the process. You can do this in your end comments, and I don't mean to put on the spot, but what's your assessment of that? Because my sense is what's coming out is pretty, you know, pretty not helpful. I mean, not big, big thinking big enough, and I know the feds have to pay the, the piece of this, but is Minnesota doing better than California? Well, I don't know. I'll let Spencer answer that. <laughs> what we need in California is money. And, and, and what's going to help us get out of this situation is money, and we don't have that. So what can we do to, I mean, this situation is huge, and not all of it is going to, it, it can be a legislative response. What it's going to have to take is partnership and education, which is exactly what you guys are doing now at Sacramento Housing Redevelopment Agency, is getting out and talking to the communities, partnering with the things, because what the state could do, in addition to regulating, but that regulating is going forward. What can you do now? We have no money. So unless we're being very creative, and coming up with ways to use local, state, and federal dollars in more creative, flexible ways to try to address the situation, I don't know what that legislative response would be. So that criticism, I think, frankly, is a bit unfair because we're $15 billion in deficit, and the only way to fix the problem is if we were to go buy up all these bad loans. Well, we only have $900 million in <laughs> deficit, so I guess we're kind of behind you on that, but we're a lot smaller, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't have too much to add. Um, we, we're sensitive to the state's budget crisis, which we think is uh, impacted by the foreclosure crisis. Uh, but there are things, we think there are things, and we hope there are things that can be done without the expenditure of money in terms of regulation going forward, which is needed. But also, I mean, in terms, in terms of the things that would be helpful now, the, this Piranha Bill, which it seems like everybody, the industry is not opposed to it, um, it seems like that one may actually pass, and that would be very helpful to people. And I think if we could get to this servicer data bill 
and and re institute reinstate it to its original form where it provided some meaningful disclosure of how companies were doing and just shed some light i think that would wind up changing practices um right away and that would be helpful to to borrowers sir um this is a personal issue for me because i'm someone that was able my wife and i bought a home in january 2005 zero down refinanced within a year the payments that we're still able to make today so my concern is as a younger person is are we i guess in danger of going back to the days where you needed to put 10 or 20 percent down because for people like me i mean i'm not going to come up with 60 grand anytime soon to be able to put a down payment on a three hundred thousand dollar home and so i i think everyone in the room here agrees that what happened can't happen again but at the same time if we're going back to the old days i mean what what do you what do i tell my friends who haven't bought a home yet how how is that gonna how do we find that balance i guess yeah i mean it's a balance it's a continuum we're worried about that too about because we're really about increasing access to credit and we're worried that things are going to shift so far the other way and we don't want that to happen we do think if if um reasonable regulations can be put in place so that borrowers and lenders and investors wall street can think people will reasonably repay those loans then we should be able to have continued access to credit and so that's that's our view of it yeah i guess um that's a, that's an interesting question i think it's I think it comes back to is home ownership the thing for everybody at any one time? If you get into a house and you can't you you can't afford it and you lose your house, you're back in the rental market with a messed up credit record. Um, so I think you know as a housing person, you know uh, what's happened in the last 20 years is housing's just been seen as solely as an investment. We've really gotten away from housing as uh, essential to human well-being which it is um, and um, so maybe we need to, to take a look and say hey we have to have all sorts of housing from rental housing to home ownership opportunities for people um, I think that's really critical and I especially at work with the St. Paul School District and we found every time a family moves the mobility rates are extremely high and that has a real direct impact on children's um, achievement in schools so I think we need to yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with it. No, I agree. Appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, and Kevin, uh, last, last Friday, the Massachusetts Attorney General filed a suit against City Council officers for their lending activities, subcontracting activities in Massachusetts, uh, for Massachusetts for steering. Um, I, I don't believe there has been. They may be thinking about it. The data, this kind of data has been out for a few years now. And to my understanding, the former, I'll just say the former Attorney General for the State of New York, was one who took this data <laughs> and, uh, and went after the larger financial institutions for these disparities. The one thing you can say about the data, as with all data, is that it's limited. It doesn't show all the variables, and some of which would be, many of which would be important to know as and to determine whether discrimination is occurring. Even though the, the purpose of the data, the congressional intent, is to help uncover discrimination. But you need to get more information. The lenders won't provide the data. And in fact, when Spitzer went after the, the national banks, the regulator for the national banks defended the national banks in essence and said, you can't collect this data to find out whether they were, there were good reasons for for these disparities in lending, because he looked at the same charts that we that I showed you, basically for New York, except the disparities were lower. This is the thing that gets me: is that he went after them for smaller dis disparities on the face than what we see across the industry in California. And when he went after them, the, the OCC said, "You can't get that data. You have no right." Okay, maybe you know this is my opinion. I see Mike in the back, so I want to make sure that I'm not overstate overstating things. But basically said, you can't enforce the Fair Housing Act on behalf of the state of New York. That's our job. 
But the one company that wasn't federally chartered at that time that he went after was Countrywide, which later got a federal charter, by the way. But at the time, they didn't have that kind of protection. He got data from them that's not available through Humda. He's Spitzer. And they had a settlement agreement where they admitted no wrong, wrongdoing. But Spitzer said, you know what? They, the data they gave me, which is not available through Humda, it didn't fully ex it, you know, it, it explained some of the disparities. It didn't fully explain the disparities. So I think it's a big, it's a big issue. The other thing with the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Attorney General, they went, at, they went after Fremont Investment and Loan, which people may remember, I think was number four on the chart. And said, and basically got a court to agree that the that a prime product, a, a major product being offered by Fremont Investment and Loan that fit certain categories was was quote presumptively unfair, to the point where Fremont Investment and Loan, at least now, is pr is precluded from proceeding in foreclosure on those categories of loans in the state of Massachusetts until they have a conversation with the Attorney General's office. I think that's quite a statement. And you know, hopefully, we'd see some of that kind of action in California. If I can uh, just mention, uh, we'll give uh, Noah the last question, and then we'll have a wrap up. Uh, but just to say that yesterday's Wall Street Journal reported that uh, Attorney General uh, Mukasey decided not to pursue action at the federal level, uh, feeling that uh, the actions being pursued at the local and state levels were sufficient. Noah. Thank you. I want to go back to what the gentleman was saying over here for a second and get your response on that. Regarding what may be the latest risk in this, and people that are going into foreclosure actually buying second property. It's on page 8 here today's Wall Street Journal. It's saying that borrowers can qualify for a second loan by proposing to rent out their current home that's about to go in foreclosure. Once it's approved, they let that fall into foreclosure. And um, it mentions Countrywide as one of the companies that's allowing this to happen, and just note that Countrywide did get. Wall Street Journal called back on it and responded to it. They didn't have any comments on it. Um, what do you guys think about that happening? There's no accurate statistics to what degree this is happening, but it's happening. You, you, you've awakened Kevin's uh, <laughs> lawyer gene, uh, but we have some reaction over here as well. <laughs> Well, we, we've seen a lot of investor-owned foreclosures in Twin Cities. And one of the things we're doing right now is uh, laboriously tracking these back. We, we have tw you can go back 20 years um, on the county's electric, electronic database. And so what we're doing is taking a number of properties and laboriously tracking back the number of transactions that's going on. How, and um, I can tell you that there's places that have had maybe seven or eight notices of pendencies filed on them, gone through three foreclosures. Um, there's been a huge amount of money that has actually flowed through these uh, structures, which are now dilapidated, having had their copper pipes torn out of them. Um, and yes, we do see certain investors that uh, own multiple properties. Um, it is amazing at this stage that you can go out and get a loan from Countrywide on, on that basis. I think it simply um, makes the point stronger than anything I could say that the federal government needs to regulate predatory lending. Um, so we don't have Countrywide Bank being exempt from the Minnesota law, for example. You should know, I, I, that's federal legislation. All right, well, I'll tell you what, let's take a couple of minutes here to wrap up. And, and I'd like to repose that question. Uh, Tia, you in particular mentioned several bills that uh, you mentioned were still alive in the California legislative process. Mm -hmm. I know that anything with money attached, as, as we know, is being held. Right. Um, but in, in, maybe let's start with you. In your view, what's kind of alive? What can we look forward to? And then let's ask for the other two panelists to comment as well. Right. I, I, um, I haven't worked uh, on 1830. Microphone. Which is the big lender reform going forward bill? But I'm very optimistic about that. I think Kevin and the author and the industry folks can get together, and I, I'm very optimistic that they'll be able to work that out. That's going for on a forward basis, though. But I did uh, list several bills that made it out of assembly appropriations um, uh, that would prob that would try to help with the issue as it exists now. Whether that was um, the Mullen Nunez bill, which allowed for more flexible use of redevelopment funds. Uh, the mandatory reporting, I know AB69, Kevin said it had been watered down some, and, and, and he, he didn't think that was as strong as it, he would like it to be. Uh, the foreclosure consultant reform, AB180 by Bass, is still alive and going on. That helps with some of the scam issues, which is existing now. 
uh, notification of rate resets. That's the bill uh, by Tarico AB 529. Um, Kevin mentioned that there were probably, as a, in addition to notification of rate reset, if there was some uh, more consumer information that could go on along with that prior to the rates being reset, that might be a, a good idea. Uh, AB 2161, which set up by uh, uh, Assemblyman Swanson, which sets up a mortgage lender complaint grievance procedure to help with dealing with this workout on the front end kind of process. AB 2509, kind of modeled after and structured after the federal uh, mortgage guarantee. The only way that works is if we get some money. I don't know where we're going to get any money. Uh, and add the uh, Codo bill, um, which was just urging Congress to pass the federal legislation. Uh, well, let's see. Briefly, I can tell you that uh, next session in Minnesota, one of the things we're hoping to do is uh, right now the Minnesota foreclosure law, You once there's a sheriff's sale, there's a six-month redemption period. And so what's happening is places are, um, first of all, no one wants to bid on these houses because they can't get access to them for six months, and no one knows what's going to happen to them. The, the homeowner can stay in that house rent-free for six months. This comes out of the kind of farm economy yeah. crisis of the Great yeah. Depression. And, um, and this is resulting in a lot of structures of being dilapidated or being vandalized and stuff. And so uh, one of the things we're looking at doing is changing that, um, that, that way that piece of the foreclosure law works and then also providing a different set of standards for investor-related foreclosures too. Because in... To have investor-owned properties sit vacant for this six-month redemption period is a real problem. Yeah. Well, as far as um, legislation goes at the state level, um, I guess it, it remains to be seen um, how things will go. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll try and push for what we think is meaningful, and, and as will all the parties. Um, the you know what a lot of the at least the prospective stuff is, seems to be focused on disclosures. And one just point to, to pull out is um, we do see a lot of non-English speaking consumers who are getting English language documents and there's a kind of a lack of clarity in, in one of our state laws um, about whether that's appropriate or legal. And we would like to see that tightened up. You know, we don't know that disclosures is a good framework for consumers. We think certain practices and and you know, provisions should just be prohibited because they're not, uh, they're, they're too prone to abuse and provide uh, an unclear benefit. But if we're going to have a disclosure regime, we think that it has to be meaningful, and that means providing the notices in the language that people negotiated their contract with. But so that's, you know, one, and there's a couple other things that are maybe less, less difficult. Um, this is money, so it's somewhat difficult, but everyone seems to agree that supporting the home loan counseling agencies is a good idea because they facilitate this discussion with the servicer who otherwise has to pull out all this information from the borrower who's probably not excited to be talking to them and may have some trust issues. So if we can continue to find money to build the capacity of the counseling agencies, that would be good. Maybe it's not from the state. Maybe it's from the lenders. I don't know. Um, and then just two other things, this idea of real estate owned properties, properties that go into foreclosure through the, some of the bills that you mentioned and the efforts that the redevelopment agency and others are thinking about, can we not just have these be sold to investors and speculators who don't care about the community? And then finally, and maybe most constructively, is is there a way that we can talk, that, can, that the counseling agencies can talk with the loan servicers, maybe through the governor's good offices or the Department of Corporations, to try and overcome some barriers which seem not to be in anybody's interest. Um, there does, there does, we want to believe that there's there's a commonality of interest at some level and can we, can we recognize that and try and move things forward and save some people's homes? Thank you. And let me, let me just conclude by uh, circling back to something that Jeff started with. He talked about how there was uh, five working groups called together by one of the legislators in uh, Minnesota to evaluate the situation as you rolled into this session. Um, and it reminds me of uh, an, an effort that actually we've just, just been involved with here at the center in pulling together people thinking about some of the wildfires issues and the fire planning. Maybe, I know, I, I think in some sense we're going to see this session play out as, it, as best it can. Uh, but my thought would be it might not be a bad idea to pull together some folk and to think.